I, I wanted to do a talk about password security um, in, a, in a way that can hopefully, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, in, in a way that will hopefully be uh, aimed, aimed at humans rather than, than security people, because often we, uh, we have these recommendations which technically make sense, but um, just aren't feasible for, for users. Uh, so the, um, what spawned this talk was a conversation I was having with one of, um, one of the more senior guys at my, uh, at my company, and he was saying, uh, with regards to giving, giving recommendations, like don't be a typical InfoSec noob and just say what is definitely best practice if it's not going to be used by the client, because you're just sort of wasting your time. So yeah, that, that's pretty much the, the idea behind this talk. Um, so yeah, just starting out, as I said, my name is Ian. Um, I'm an InfoSec consultant at MWR. Um, I've been there about a year now. Uh, I like hacking things, and I'm particularly interested in password cracking and um, passwords in general. So uh, just a quick agenda. We're going to look at attacking passwords, how to protect them, um, what, what threats they are to general users, uh, how to store and manage passwords, and then right at the end, just sort of some research I've done into passphrase cracking. Um, so just uh, before we dive into it, can you just sort of uh, take a look at these uh, passwords and try and, try and uh, order them in your head just from least secure to most secure, most secure to, secure to least secure. I'll just give you a couple of seconds just to try and get your head around it. Cool, so we're gonna come back to this slide later. Uh, we're just gonna go through a little bit of um, background, I guess. Uh, so th there's, um, there's two types of, uh, I guess, primary attacks for going up to passwords. The first is online attacks. Uh, so a notable example of this is the, I I the iCloud leak. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, saw that, but if not, uh, some, uh, some guys got hold of uh, private accounts of primarily celebrities by uh, two, two main attack vectors. Uh, uh, primarily phishing, but also exploiting an API issue which didn't rate limit uh, guessing on, on iCloud accounts. So what they could do is they could just continuously um, guess passwords until they eventually got in. Um, so obviously the issue with this is it's um, slow and easily detected. Uh, like you're, uh, you're, you're limited by your network connection, you've got to uh, deal with TCP, HTTP, all that kind of stuff uh, just to send the password across and then it's got to get evaluated server-side. Um, and obviously usernames are required. So if you're going after a certain user, you need the actual username. Um, if you're just going after any user, you need a, a big list of usernames. Um, and yeah. So then the, the other way would be offline password attacks. So uh, this, is, this is more what I'm interested in. Um, so one of the advantage are advantages of it is it's a lot faster because you have the hash passwords uh, on your database, uh, sorry, on your hard drive. Um, so the idea would be you'd, you'd get a um, probably a forums database or uh, so some large websites database and you would then throw it into something like John or Hashcat in order to try and recover um, a whole lot of passwords. So a notable example of this is Linux Mint. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure if Strauss is here. I see he runs that um, on his <laughs> desktop. So um, I may or may not have his password somewhere. Um, yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I think they were running a, a WordPress site uh, their forum got hacked, DB dumped, and the, the ISO was actually backdoored for a day or so, um, uh, not so long ago. Um, so yeah, I'm a Hashcat fanboy. I don't use a lot of John. I recently found out you can do quite cool things in John, but yeah, I'm not gonna talk about it at all. So I'm just gonna run through some basic Hashcat attacks one can do. So the, the most uh, obvious example is dictionary attacks where you essentially just take um, words and hash them and see what happens. Uh, so Ways you can build up these dictionaries are plain text password dumps, so Rock U is a big one. Uh, it was a forum dump many, many years ago now. Um, but just any plain, word, plain text passwords you can get your hands on are usually gonna be uh, used again. Um, things you've previously cracked yourself, uh, just sitting in your hashcat.pot file. Um, keyboard patterns are something which users actually use for some reason, so sort of, if you look at your keyboard, like Q, A, Z, uh, X, S, W, so just up and down or left and right. Um, these, uh, there's large dictionaries for that kind of stuff. Uh, also your NumPad, 753, et cetera. Um, and then you can do more exciting things. So you can scrape websites, get lyrics from songs, books, Wikipedia, uh, maybe uh, scrape like the B-Sides website, for example. So <laughs> if you were to scrape the B-Sides website, you'd probably get words like Cape Town B-Sides, Table Mountain, IPA Pale Ale, just sort of Cape Town things. Um, so, then uh, another type of attack is rule-based uh, rule attacks. So the, the idea here is just sort of try and mimic 
how, pass, uh, how users create passwords. So maybe I would append an S to a password or a one, two, three. Um, maybe, um, maybe I'm a lead hacker, hacksaw, so I replace my S's with percentage, uh, sorry, with uh, dollar signs and that kind of stuff. Um, or even just reverse words, uh, ju just, just stuff like that. Um, you can obviously combo rules together to create uh, more interesting passwords. Um, and then you get brute force attacks, so n not, a, not a lot involved there. You just sort of guess a whole lot of combinations. So for example, from A to Z, um, something else you can do is you can actually brute force on a word list. So you'll start at secure password, and you can brute force past that, which actually gives you some really cool, um, some really cool uh, advantages. I'll, I'll show, you, show you one uh, a little bit later. Um, and then a combinator attack, so that's literally just combined two dictionaries. We, we saw what a dictionary attack was now, so uh, we got dictionary one, dictionary uh, two. I'm not sure if I've got a laser, laser pointer. Nope. Um, so yeah, we take sort of uh, our, our previous dictionary one and we append it to quite simple words, and we have things like Cape Town Boy, Table Mountain Love, IPA Pale, yeah, Pale Ale Love, etc. You guys can all read. Um, so the advantage of this is you can, uh, you can sort of crack longer passwords and this is, this is something that people often do. Um, okay, so going back, uh, now we know how people uh, like to attack passwords, so just uh, what, what are good ways to defend the, the two things we just looked at. Uh, so obviously for, for online attacks, a strong password policy is really important. Try and increase the number of guesses they need to do, especially since they're limited by the speed of their network connection and uh, server-side processing and all that. Um, then obviously account lockout's quite good too, so if I guess three incorrect login in attempts, uh, maybe make me send an email to myself or wait 15 minutes, exponentially back that off over time, so 15, 30, an hour, whatever. Um, and also just logging and monitoring is, is a really easy way to pick this up. So say for example, if either a user tried to log in 10,000 times recently or all of my users tried password one um, recently, that, that would probably be an indicator of, of something bad happening. Um, and then for offline attacks, so it's a little bit different. Obviously, we're not in, con in control of the server anymore. They've, they've got all of our hashes and uh, sitting on their machine, so they're not, no longer limited by our controls. So what we can do is we can um, ensure that we're storing the password securely, or uh, yeah, securely, I guess. So once again, strong password policy is important, trying to increase the guesses that they need to perform. And then uh, salted passwords and iterative hashing algorithms are really good. So we'll, we'll go into the what that is in a sec. I'm just going to take some water because my mouth's quite dry. Cool. So what exactly is password salting? Um, essentially, you just add a unique value to each password. Um, the, the idea of this is to prevent uh, lookup tables. So back when MD5 and SHA-1 were really big things, uh, people created large lookup tables for these. Um, they're called rainbow tables. That's why I included the little um, pride symbol there. Um, so yeah, j just the, the general idea is if I've, if I've got password one, uh, say, say three of my users have password one, uh, these will all hash to different things if, if different salts are applied, which means that they can't, um, they, they can't be looked up and it'll slow down the guessing a lot. Um, <coughs> and then a sort of finer issue, which um, I think people don't think of very often. Uh, so th the salted value needs to be calculated for each guess, which obviously makes sense, but um, the effect this has on, um, on the amount of guesses is, is more, than, uh, more than people sometimes think. So uh, <laughs> this slide is actually quite similar to this, the previous slide. I couldn't find a good way to convey this. But, um, sorry, what am I trying to say? Okay, yes. So for example, uh, I have my password salt and I've, I want to look it up in my, my list of hash files. So I, I, I work that out and I, I look it up. But now I want to try password with, with an exalt. Um, I've, I've got to do that again. So essentially what this means is that for every, um, for every hash that I'm, I'm trying against, I then, uh, like, this multiplies each, uh, each guess I'm making. Sorry, yeah, I've, I've, got to, I've got to calculate it for each guess I'm making. So this essentially sort of, like, blows up the amount of guesses one needs to make for each, um, each password they're comparing, um, which obviously slows things down quite a lot. Um, another way to slow things down is um, iterative hashing algorithms. So <coughs> the, f the first thing is why not MD5? Um, I'm sure you guys all know what MD5 is or have seen MD5 at some point. So uh, the MD in, uh, in MD5 stands for Message Digest, as far as I know. Um, and this was created for checking the integrity of things, uh, of, of files, to see if they'd been uh, or intentionally or unintentionally modified during transit. 
so these, these algorithms are made for speed. Uh, th you want them to be calculated fast on, on, for example, large files in order to check their integrity, um, which is at odds with what's, uh, what we want from a password hashing algorithm. So um, <laughs> because devs are, are often in charge of this, uh, we thought, how do we make things slower? Well, we just do it over and over again. So um, that's pretty much where iterative hashing algorithms came from. Uh, so you, you take the hash, uh, you work it out once, and then you just go into a loop, and you just keep working it out based on the previous value. So uh, the, the zeroth value uh, determines the first value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at the end, you just return out the hash. Um, so obviously, if I'm doing something 2,000 times per, uh, per guess, it, it slows things down considerably. Um, but more importantly, what this does is, uh, so GPUs are really good at password cracking because of the fact that they've got multiple calls, which can then uh, take advantage of parallel processing. Um, what, what iterative hashing algorithms do is they, they prevent the, the GPUs from being able to take advantage of their, um, their parallel abilities. So yeah, GPUs are uh, really good at maths, vector stuff, um, and, and parallelism. Whereas if I'm waiting on the previous value, I, I, can't, really, I can't really do this. Um, so what this ends up uh, meaning is that uh, CPUs are often faster on, on certain hash hashing algorithms like this um, th than GPUs, which is, um, yeah, which sort of ruins the idea of a password cracking rig. <coughs> so moving on to, uh, moving on to why, why secure password policies. So the, the idea is we want to force users to have passwords which contain as much entropy as possible. Um, we know that pass, uh, passwords are going to be chosen based on the absolute minimum that a user has to put in. Uh, so for example, if I've got uh, lowercase, uppercase digits and maybe a special, I'm gonna choose maybe password one with a exclamation mark or something similar, maybe my name uh, capitalized. Um, yeah, so, so th that's, that's the idea. Um, I generally hate entropy calculations, but I'll, I'll do a really basic one here. So. Uh, essentially, the idea is character set. Uh, we've got lowercase, uppercase digits. That's uh, 62 characters, uh, which means that the worst case number of guesses for a, an eight-digit password is 62 to the eight. So character set times character set times character set times character set eight times. Um, so th th that's the general idea. Um, and yeah, essentially, we, we want to create lots of entropy. So we say st things like use digits, specials uh, as much as possible. Um, and what that's uh, trying to achieve is essentially this. So all this graph shows us um, just, you can pretty much ignore the, the days on the left. Um, so x, x is number of characters for those who can't see and y is time. Um, and as we start getting to sort of eight, nine, 10, uh, the, the amount of time uh, increases exponentially, which starts to make these types of things infeasible. Um, so yeah, th that's, that's the, the original approach or the sort of uh, the way it's historically been done. Um, but we, we're starting to see a, a bit of a shift recently. So I believe Shaw, I think that's his name, the guy from SensePost who was chatting about, um, about geopolitical stuff earlier mentioned NIST. So NIST is the American, uh, oh, I knew this earlier, uh, something about standards. <laughs> what does NIST stand for again? <laughs> national, there we go. So yeah, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, and they're, they're responsible for creating uh, a lot of these types of standards. I think they also do the, um, the SHA competition to create the new, the new SHA algorithm. And they've recently come up with some new password, uh, some password requirements, which people will have to abide by in order to take advantage of the 15%, um, 15%, I can't remember what he was talking about, 15, <laughs> sorry? Tax. tax break, yes, exactly, the tax break for, uh, for complying with NIST. So um, what they've said is some, some basic stuff, so a minimum of eight characters. Uh, we all know eight characters is, is borderline, but uh, quite a big thing is what they've also said is a maximum of 64 characters. So the absolute minimum maximum that someone who complies with this can set is 64, which means that I will always be able to set a 64 character password at least um, on a NIST compliant website, which is quite big for, um, for password manager users and maybe people who like to type sentences. Uh, no password expiry, so this is something we've been recommending for a while, but it, it still seems to creep in every now and then. Uh, resetting your password every three months doesn't add security. It does mitigate um, or like uh, diminish exposure. So if your password does get breached, um, you're only ac the attacker only has it for uh, X amount of time. But um, 
what often happens with password expiry is the fact that you'll just um, append one to your number or change your special character or something like that. So it, it, it often doesn't add the, the intended security. Um, and also um, just disallow known bad passwords. So um, this is something that's actually quite common in password policies, at least for good websites, where you'll try and set your password to password and it'll say, sorry, uh, we've got this blacklist and password isn't that blacklist, so you, um, you're not able to set that password. Um, you, you can use uh, old breaches and stuff to, cr to create these. Um, okay, so just um, now that we've, we've got this knowledge, uh, we're just going back to the, the list we looked at at the beginning. So the, the gist of it is all of these passwords are bad. Um, sorry, did I go louder there? So uh, the, the first one is just dictionary plus a rule. The second one is a Polish word, which is just a different kind of dictionary. Um, we've got a keyboard walk, which is quas, yeah, I'm not gonna try and pronounce that. Uh, we've got mountain love, which is obviously a really common Cape Tonian one. Correct horse battery staple. Um, yeah, I, I think we've all seen the comic. I didn't feel the need to put that up. Sometimes your words just hypnotize me is a, a biggie song. Um, Educate yourself if you don't know what that is. Um, and then the of security strategic st strategy strategic at is actually just um, a scrape from the B-Sides website, an actual scrape from the B-Sides website. Because um, that was actually just a typo um, on, on the website. Uh, yeah, so uh, while some of these might look better than others, they're, they're all not, not really great um, if, we, if we take a, a good approach to cracking these passwords. So then moving on to the personal space. Um, what do I, as, as a user of passwords, um, so someone who interacts with, with technology, uh, have to do in order to keep myself secure? So I, I think we all know we've seen some quite big um, high-profile breaches recently. So Dropbox, LinkedIn, uh, you guys can read all the logos that are on there. Um, these are websites we typically trust, uh, and their databases are getting dumped and ending up in the, the hands of essentially bad guys. Um, and, and also on that, so Ashley Madison and Adult Friend Finder, uh, for those of you who don't know, these are sort of affair websites or like cheat on your partner websites um, where you're not awfully worried about your password not being correctly hashed. You're more worried about your wife leaving and taking everything, um, which, which is going to be the, the outcome of that. So yeah, I'm not going to give you any recommendations to protect you against that. Don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> but... But yeah, um, for, for general password security, let, let's see what we can do. So yeah, th I mean, the, the problem, the, the reason people actually get affected is because of password reuse. So what will happen is um, I'm, I'm a bad guy, I breach a database, I then sell it to some other bad guys who will try and crack the passwords and then either sell it on or uh, try, and, try and abuse uh, other social media or whatever account uh, using the same password. Um, and we know that password reuse is bad, and uh, <laughs> hey man, I do it. I'm, I'm sure most of you guys do it. Uh, but how, how can we stop it? So the, the, obvious, uh, the obvious thing that like an infosec noob, for example, would say is generate random unique passwords and they must be so long and all that. But how can we reasonably do that as, as users who have other concerns in our life? Um, so a thought, maybe password managers. Um, I'm not gonna get into a debate about which one's the best. Um, I use KeePass, uh, but yeah, I mean, people start wars about this kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm really not gonna get into it. Um, these, are, these are three really popular ones, so uh, take a look at whatever you, uh, you want. So the idea of a password manager, sorry, that's slightly misaligned, I thought I'd fix that, um, is that you've got one really big secure password in order to unlock all your other passwords. You don't have to remember anything other than your, your one secure password. Um, but what this still means is that you do need one, at least one secure password, which, which a lot of people don't have. So um, just in terms of usability of KeePass, uh, here's, here's the kinds of things you can do. So generating password is, is incredibly simple. You click a new profile, uh, you type in the website you want it to be, and then you can select what you want. So say, uh, <laughs> this is something I do. If I see that it's um, a bad website, I'll leave out uh, white spaces and minus, uh, just in case it's, uh, it isn't being escaped properly and it messes with the website. Um, but yeah, you, you can choose, you can uh, toggle the checkbox to make uh, your length increase, and you can see the password if you don't like it, uh, generate a new one. This isn't the password I'm using, by, by the way, so um, yeah. Uh, and then just in terms of usability, so I haven't typed in a password other than my KeePass password in quite a while. Um, there's, there's really cool things like Control-B for the username, Control-C for the uh, 
for the password, and then the magic one, control V. So all you do is you point it at a, um, at a login page and hit control V, and it'll sort of log you in automatically and do some, some misdirection so that you're, uh, if you're being key logged, it'll be harder to, uh, for the attacker to get your password. So it sort of backspaces a bit and types random characters and all that. Yes, okay, so um, so often that'll be done on the HTML element where you can just set pasting is disabled, um, and then you can just toggle it back on. You just take that out of the HTML element. Um, but th there are times when you've got to actually type it in manually. And some people will do it, so for example, the um, one of the passwords when you're, when you're creating a new password, like the, either the confirm or the previous one, like the, the first one will allow posting, but the other one won't. Um, so yeah. If that's the case, you can actually, I'm not sure if I've got it here. Oh, I cut off the top. But you can, uh, th there's like a tab at the top which lets you uh, create different kinds of passwords. So yeah, I'm probably not gonna pull open my key pass right now. But uh, <laughs> um, you, you can choose passwords that are, for example, pronounceable, um, which are easier to type and all, and all that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you can also play with the, the character set a bit and just maybe just increase the length um, to maintain entropy but also Typeability. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, sorry, that's a bit small. So, th that is one of the issues which I'll discuss on the slide. So, uh, obviously, password manager is really cool. I can create unique passwords, uh, and I don't have to remember many passwords, just, just the one, maybe my Gmail password, which I need to type on my phone every now and then, uh, type of stuff. And changing passwords is really easy. You just click the regenerate button and obviously copy paste it into the change password field, and then you're good. Uh, but but there, there are quite a lot of cons. So the specialized software, people see this as quite a big barrier to entry. I'm not sure why, it's, it's actually really easy. Um, also you need at least one secure password, as I said, many people don't have even one secure password. So you're gonna have to find a way to generate that. We'll chat about that in the following slides. Um, and then a, a really big issue, or the next two are really big issues. So syncing between devices, which means, for example, on my work PC and my home PC, I want maybe my, um, my Bitbucket Heroku, that kind of stuff. Um, I want secure passwords on those, but I, I also want those syncs between, between those two computers. Um, and then manually entering passwords. So often you'll encounter things like having to type passwords on your phone primarily, um, maybe into your, your new smart kettle you bought. Um, I, know, I know Andrew Mack has like lots of <laughs> shit IoT devices in his home, which, uh, which he has to connect to his, his network. Um, and also there's a single point of failure. So th there, have been, there have been issues with, with password managers in the past. Um, but, but I don't see that as a, um, a huge issue. E everything has, has O-days. Um, but just on that, so most of these issues have been in password managers in the browser. Please do not store your passwords in the browser. I think we all know way too much about, or hopefully everyone's at least heard that browser exploits are fairly common. Um, and that sounds like a bad idea. For example, Firefox O-day like recently. Cool, so uh, as I said in the previous slide, we actually need to figure out how to generate at least one secure password, so uh, let, let's look at that. Uh, as I said, I hate entropy calculations, so I've, um, I've fuzzed the numbers a bit uh, just because I can't put a number that long, um, and I don't like ease. So uh, th the first thing is, what's the difference between a password and a passphrase? You're using them pretty interchangeably up till now, um, but yeah, um, how, do, how do I tell the difference? So. It's quite open, uh, the definition. I don't think it's been strictly defined, but my, uh, the way I define it is multiple words. Uh, for example, a sentence, uh, not necessarily a sentence that makes sense, but just multiple words put together, preferably with spaces, but not necessarily. Um, yeah, so that's how I would define it. And then what makes a good passphrase? So how do I, how do I generate a passphrase that is, is better than a password, and, and why are these better than passwords? So yeah, just taking a look at entropy. So we say we've got lowercase plus uppercase, uh, to the power of eight, that's not an awful lot. Uh, you can do the math yourself if you don't believe me. Um, but then I, then I generate um, a similar passphrase, which is uh, eight words long, which is Cape Town is great this time of year. And um, if I were to look at it using the same, uh, the same entropy requirements, I would say, for example, uh, lowercase, uppercase, spaces to the power of 44, which is an unbelievably large number. Um, that's infeasible, this password will never be cracked. Uh, I can use this forever, etc. Um, but th that's not true. Uh, this is why I don't like entropy calculations because th the, w the way to actually look at it is words in the English language to the power of eight. Uh, because for the most part, you, w you will include uh, 
English words in your, in your passphrase. Uh, not necessarily, you can probably fight me about that later, but um, I, I think this is a more reasonable way of looking at it, which then essentially just makes it, uh, the words in the English language are your character set, which is obviously more than 26 or 50, 52 um, to the power of eight, which is, uh, which is still considerably large, but uh, significantly less than, than lots. Um, so ways to generate these, uh, these passwords. Uh, we're going to look at three different types. Uh, so the first is diceware. I'm not sure if, has anyone heard of diceware before? Uh, general nod. Okay. Like two people. So the way diceware works is um, there, are, there are dictionaries and um, they sort of uh, map to words. So they're indexed by values which are all essentially the value on a dice. So like a d6. Um, so the way it works is you roll five dice. Dies, I don't know. Um, in order to get the in order to get the index for your first word, and then you repeat this process over and over to create as many as many words as you um, deem fit. So yeah, um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what are the, what are the issues with dice? Where it sounds like a great deal. Um, obviously, I get quite a lot of randomness. I'm literally just rolling a dice to create my password. No one's in control of that. Um, if I'm if I'm very paranoid. Uh, no one's given me this password. I've done it myself. And yeah, hopefully my die is legit. Um, but th there's, there's, yeah, as I said, there's quite a lot of content. So the diceware dictionaries, um, at least until recently, um, have included many really weird words. So these are just examples of words. So Dara, Kit, Mondo, Seneca, the character, question mark, etc. I guess jar is a word. <laughs> I don't know why I put that in there. Um, but then... Um, the issue, like, th this sort of filters down to the next thing. So if I've got words that I don't understand or can't use readily, um, it's a lot harder to remember a passphrase that contains them. So cleft, cam, si sinoid, whatever, um, that passphrase over there is not one I um, created in order to prove a point. It is literally the example they give on their website as a sample passphrase. And that just makes no sense to me. I'm, I think I would really struggle to, uh, to memorize that. Granted, not as hard as, um, as a completely random password, but... Still not exactly what I'm looking for in a passphrase. Uh, so, uh, fortunately for us, uh, there's a, a great startup called Perio. Um, they do, uh, what do they do? Uh, so I think they do instant messaging, something like that. Uh, but uh, their selling point is that it's super secure and uh, they do some complicated key deri uh, derivation schemes and all that. And they recently actually did a, a, a talk called Passphrases for Humans. Um, I thought I had stolen both their title and their content until I went and watched the video. Fortunately, I hadn't. Um, but they, they did some really cool work into generating word lists um, for diceware type password generation, but word lists that make more sense. So they, uh, what they did is they did quite a lot of research into this, actually. So they, they took, um, they figured out how many words the, um, the bottom percentile of people know. So I think that was about 15,000 uh, in, in English, that is. Um, and they, they aimed it to that. I think it was about uh, the 15th percentile. So sort of um, 15 percentile up is quite a large amount of people, uh, especially if you consider a bell curve. Um, so they target their, uh, the sort of complexity of their words towards that. They then do things like remove um, words which could be considered, uh, yeah, um, which people could be offended by. It's 2016, people get offended a lot. So they removed all those words. Um, and then they, they came up with this, this core set of words which hopefully make a lot more sense than diceware words. So here's just an example, decent shell dripping handy industry. Granted, this makes no sense, but I know all of those words. I can probably spell them, and if I can remember them individually, I can, I can probably recreate my passphrase. So, so they've actually got this really cool site where you can select your language and select your length and just keep generating. And um, sometimes I sit there for quite a long time just trying to get good passphrases. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really great, and definitely check them out. Uh, so th the pros of uh, the pros of Perio are there. The passphrases are definitely easier to remember, um, but not necessarily easy. And there's no hard words, so they they put a lot of effort into making sure that everyone can or most people can understand the words that are being used. Uh, the cons are they're generating the passphrase for you, so you don't have a lot of control over exactly what you're getting. Obviously, you can keep clicking the button, but um, some people prefer the control over what they're uh, choosing, and. The, the passphrases are at best abstract and nonsensical. Um, they, they just, yeah, they just aren't, aren't something which users can, uh, can remember as well. So yeah, they, they lack meaning to the user. Um, 
So this is, I see the next slide is actually not what I thought it was. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, keep talking for now. So, <laughs> so what I did is, um, at the beginning of the year, I joined a security company, knowing not a lot about security. And I had to choose some, some secure passwords. So I had to get like Lux encryption passwords, so um, encryption on your hard drive, uh, key pass, and my, um, my sort of host itself uh, password. And I had to generate these in quite a short amount of time. So here's what I did, because I'm, I'm a flippin' noob. Or, uh, damn, I still don't have the slide I want. Um, so <laughs> uh, essentially what I did is I, I based these on natural language. Um, so books, poems, uh, movies, et cetera. You take something at least, um, at least marginally related to that, and then screw with it so that hopefully someone like me can't, uh, can't crack it again. So I did this, I came up with these passwords, I still use them, um, and then I decided, hey, what it, can I actually crack them? Like, could, could someone like me reasonably crack my passwords? So what I did is I, I did some research into this. Um, the, the, first, the first thing I did is I, I tried n-grams. So is everyone familiar with n-grams? Or actually, uh, so what an n-gram is, is you, you take a sentence and you just chunk it. So n is like, uh, like n, n in maths, so it can change. So you get bigrams, trigrams, four grams, five grams, et cetera. Um, and so, so these are trigrams of the sentence, I love the smell of napalm in the morning, which apparently I'm too young to know about, uh, according to Russ. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Um, so yeah, essentially you just sort of chunk the, chunk the sentence and see what happens. Obviously, trigrams aren't super useful for passphrases, but as it gets longer, um, you, can, you can get some good hits. Um, so these, these are some actual n-grams I got. Um, many of these are, are based on religion, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what that says. I guess it's easy to remember Bible verses, especially if it's something you grew up with. Uh, so yeah, they're also quite dark. Um, so dark, the kind of man. There is no fate but what we make. That's actually a Terminator reference. Great, um, great one, that. Um, and then I took a look at Markov chains. So uh, I, I did some work with Markov chains at university. Um, I'm sure most of you have encountered them in maths at some point. So the idea of a Markov chain is, oof, I'm gonna, probably going to butcher this, but essentially it's just a, a state with percentages in order to transfer to the new state. Um, so for example, at state I, I've got 33% chance to uh, transfer to state don't, and I've got 66% chance to, trans to go to like. So for example, you can build a sentence of, of Markov chains, um, like I don't like butter, uh, et cetera. You, you can all read that. Um, so Markov chains actually come up in traditional password cracking quite a lot as well, where you can create um, words based on the dictionary. So uh, if I crack enough Polish passwords, for example, I can figure out that, I don't know, um, vowels, uh, vowels aren't great, lots of consonants usually uh, appear together, and I can crack uh, Polish passwords based just off of um, learning from the, from the data set. Um, so yeah, what I did is I, um, sorry, I actually skipped this. Man, I, I wish I didn't delete that slide. So, so what I did um, for all of this, the n-grams and Markov chains and the, the later one is I went and I, um, I went and I, I didn't listen to many people's terms of service. So I just scraped as much data as I could get my dirty little hands on. Um, I scraped books, songs, uh, like everything. Um, and that's uh, quite an issue right now because I would love to share this, um, <laughs> what I've done, but like, I, I think there's quite a lot of trouble. Uh, if I do, uh, I, I definitely um, read some terms of service, which I was breaking uh, in the process of this, but I had fun. And, <laughs> and that's all that matters. So, um, yeah, so, so the idea is you, you take quite a lot of big uh, text. For example, I can then train a Markov chain once I've scraped all of Eminem's songs or Biggie's songs to, uh, to for example, rap like Biggie. Um, and the, the, la the larger your data set is, the, the better it'll get, obviously. Um, it's, it's no lyrical genius. So these are some Markov chains I got. Um, I think, so Markov chains are interesting because I managed to get my ex's password and my boss's password both on the, um, on, on the same type of, um, type of attack, which I think is really great. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where the other one came from. Um, and then I did some sentence analysis. So se my sentence analysis was a great idea, it didn't turn out so well. So the, the, the idea behind it was find out what sentences look like, so with regards to figures of speech. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna pause a whole lot of sentences that I see in text, and I'm gonna create sort of skeleton sentences that consist of the figures of speech. So a really obvious example would be noun, verb, noun. So iron kicks ball, or whatever. Um, 
and I can then sort of substitute in different nouns uh, into, into that sentence in order to try and get a, a more reasonable result. Um, <coughs> so yeah, that was the idea. Sounded great at the time, did not work out very well. Um, so yeah, j just an example of what that would look like. Um, uh, this obviously shows one of the, the issues with, uh, with my training set is I don't know much about NLTK, which is the, um, the natural language toolkit in Python. Um, so for example, these aren't all the same uh, figures of speech. I obviously didn't train my data correctly. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the idea. So our town thought hit new, yeah. Um, th th that was the idea behind it. Um, and then some, some sentence analysis based passphrases. So uh, you'll never guess this password. I would love to hear from you. I just want to hug that guy, man. I feel really bad. And Romeo and Juliet love each other. That's a great one. Um, so this, I'm lying a little bit. This was actually a, um, like this part was a brute force, uh, although it could have also been from a combinator attack. Um, so yeah, th that, that was what I did. Um, I had some fun, but I didn't get really good results, and that's pretty much it. So um, all, all I want people to take away from this is when generating passphrases, if you're going to be like me and be a dumbass and choose natural language-based passphrases, try to um, j just, yeah, just consider these things. So passphrases are vulnerable to the same kinds of attacks as normal passwords. Um, dictionary attacks, uh, I think I've um, beat that to death. Rule-based attacks, I can do all kinds of things. Um, Especially with, with really, uh, really complicated rules, I can often uh, just uh, with like a, a random large uh, set of rules, I can often uh, reverse what one did in a, um, wh what one changed in, in a passphrase, if that makes sense, uh, in order to get it uh, far enough away from the original sentence. Um, Markov chains work pretty well. Sentence structure analysis doesn't work very well. Um, but yeah, th these are the types of attacks I think a reasonable person would apply to passphrases, at least at the moment. Uh, so yeah, just bear that in mind. I, I should probably go and change some of my passphrases, um, bearing that in mind. Um, I have the same slide again. And yeah, so future work. Um, things I want to do is I want to figure out how licenses work so that I can actually um, not get arrested if, uh, if I ever want to release this. So for example, um, my understanding, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, with songs is that the artists own the lyrics. So I have no idea how um, lyrics websites are allowed to exist, but the artist owns all the lyrics to all the songs that they make. And if you have that, you are sort of in breach of whatever that means. Um, then I wanted to figure out how NLTK works. So I have no idea how it works. I had a lot of fun playing with it. Um, my, my honors project was actually in natural language um, programming or processing, uh, but I still couldn't figure it out. So yeah, I'd like to play with that a bit. And then automate passphrase attacks. So one, once I've got a better, um, a better tool to work with, I'd like to just uh, bring it to the level where password attacks currently are, where you sort of run password.sh um, and then go do something else for two weeks while it sort of runs and uh, iteratively cracks all the passwords. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think I'm just in time. Yeah, uh, yeah so my Twitter's Iron Todd. I have like hardly any followers. Please follow me. It makes me feel so happy. 